Let's see how this will work. Okay. Can I look? Oh, very loud. Even by my standards, that's loud. Can, can, can you hear me? Tick, tick, tick. Yes, I hear tick. that. Who's chairing this, Canella? Are you doing it from there? No, this is supposed to be doing it. She is there. She should in the Who? I can't hear you, Canella. Ginella, we can't hear you. Can you raise your volume at your end? Um, yeah. Yeah, I will try to raise my volume. Can you hear me now, Jerry? Can you raise Can your voice, Nella? Can you hear me now? Nella, we need you louder. Uh, the microphone is now at maximum volume. Jerry, can, can you hear me? Perfect, Ginella, perfect. Who's chairing today? Are you chairing it from there? No, Vishaka Data is supposed to be there in the room and she should be chairing. Okay, she's not here that I know of. Do you remember Vishaka? Shaka, remember the blind Indian woman? From the yeah, okay. We can't find her. She's not here, Ginella. Who are the speakers, Ginella? <laughs> it's you, Shadi, and me, and Bushaka. Is that it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, um, right. I might just have to consult a little bit here then. Gillo is here. All right, I can share it if I know who the speakers are. If, uh, it's, well, the speakers are uh, Vishaka's moderator, Nidhi, um, who is also from India, you, Jerry, Shadi, who's there online, uh, Rashka's online, and myself. <clears throat> Shadi online, is it? Who, who's before you? Who's before you, you Jerry? Jerry, yes, I'm online. I hope you can hear, hear me. Hi, Shadi. Are you speaking? I am, yes. Okay. Look, it's, um, it's actually now uh, on the hour and should be starting, right? We is the remote moderator there? Yes. That's no? Leila. Okay, the remote moderator is there. We don't have Bushaka yeah. and we don't have Midi. Right. Okay. Um, 
Look, we'll wait a couple of more minutes. And if, um, if they don't turn up, I'll have to chair it remotely. Um, is that okay with everyone? I think, Gunala, you can um, go ahead and proceed for the session. I'm Bashkur. Okay. Yes, Bashkur, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Gunala Astbrink, and I'm the co organizer of this session on mobile apps and accessibility. And I welcome you all to this particular session. Uh, we will have a range of very interesting speakers. My co-organizer um, um, is not here yet. Um, so because Bishaka Data hasn't arrived yet, I will chair uh, remotely, but if she enters the room, um, I welcome her to continue chairing um, in, in place. The session uh, will have five speakers. The first one is Nidhi, who is from India, and she will be speaking about her personal experiences as a um, person with a vision impairment and uh, unfortunately I believe she is not yet in the room so um, we will pass on straight away to Jerry Ellis from Ireland who will speak about the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and, and what impact that has when it comes to um, mobile apps and general web accessibility. So I'll pass it on now to Jerry. Thank you very much. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear okay? Um, I usually don't have problems being heard. I'm, I'm not quite talking about what uh, Gunella mentioned there. But I'm, I've changed it slightly and I'll tell you why. Just two days ago was the 100th anniversary of the signing of the uh, armistice and it happened just outside of Paris here and partially because of the trust of the First World War and partially for other reasons Paris was at the heart of the beginning of the United Nations so I want to go through a bit of a history of the United Nations and maybe where it came from and the important part that Paris played seeing that we are here in Paris and leading right up to the UN Convention because I think most people in the room here would be fairly familiar with the convention. So let's jump into it and go right back. First, the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson uh, made, it, made a, a statement to joint session of Congress in the United States on January 8, 1918, before even this, the, uh, the end of the First World War. And he proposed 14 points for peace. And one of those, point 14, was the establishment of a general association of nations. And this was to afford, uh, this was to guarantee peace into the future. The League didn't start straight after that. There was a peace, part, there was a peace conference held in Paris immediately after the First World War. It approved, an appro uh, approved a proposal to establish the League of Nations on the 25th of January 2019, only a couple of months after the end of the First World War, which as we know ended on the 11th of the 11th. The, and the League was established by, by part one of the Treaty of Versailles at that time. An interesting just, uh, an interesting just aside, because we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about diversity and inclusion and that was Article 7 of the Covenant that established the League said that all positions shall be open to men and women. That was forward-looking for its time. 
but that's aside. The first council meeting of the uh, United Nations was also held in Paris. And that was on the 16th of January 2020. And the first General Assembly was held on the 15th of November 1920 in Geneva. So it moved to Geneva at that stage. There were 107 sessions of the, United, of the League of Nations between then and the end of, at the start of the Second World War. But because of economic situations and for many other reasons, we know that the, the League of Nations collapsed and the Second World War took place. And another small aside was even though Woodrow Wilson was one of the first to propose it, a notable absence from the League was the United States because the US Senate refused to join. The final meeting of the League took place on the 12th of April 1946 in Geneva at the end of the, uh, the Second World War. Delegates from 34 nations attended that, so it was quite far, uh, far reaching for its time. And what they did was they transferred the, uh, the, the, good, uh, the, the assets of the League of Nations to the United Nations, which had been uh, set up by a Tehran conference during the war in 1943. So from 1946 on then, we had the United Nations as we knew it. One of the first things that the United Nations did was the, uni the, uni the Declaration of Universal Rights in 1948. That was December 10th, 1948, when it was launched. And I, I think from that, a lot of rights for, for women and for people with disabilities began to flow. So that was a very, very key, to, very key date, 10th of December, 1948. One of the, uh, the uh, institutions that were set up under the United Nations was the World Health Organization. And they, uh, they established the international classification uh, on impairments, disability, and handicap in 1980. For many people, myself included, right through the 80s, we considered this to be far too medically based because we said it, we're not sick. We're people with disabilities who want to be fully included in society. We're not sick and we don't need to be cured. So that was a major contention for people with disabilities, but it was a major uh, uh, declaration all the same. If we jump forward a little bit, we had the, UN, the first UN year of disabled persons, and that was in 1981. And that really concentrated the mind on accessibility for people with disabilities within the United Nations. Up to then, the World Health Organization was the main, main group looking at it, and as we already said, that was too medical. Then we get into the really nice stuff. The World Program of Action on, uh, concerning people with disabilities was launched on December 3rd, 1982. And you note that, note that date of December 3rd, we still mark it every year as the UN International Day of Disabilities. And that's where that came from, it was from the launching of that, uh, that first world program. <coughs> it concentrated for the first time on equality and uh, human rights. So this was moving away from the medical model and starting to move towards the, uh, the social model of disability. It was a key time. It defines handicap as the interaction between people and their environment. So, okay, the word handicap is still there, but it's beginning to look at not just the person being sick or having a disability, but at the environment, and that is a key concept. 1983 to 1992 was the decade of people with disabilities, and it led to a wonderful thing called the international, the UN standard rules on the equalization of opportunities for people with disabilities. Now there's a mouthful. <laughs> they, were the same, they were launched on December 20th, 1993. There were 22 rules and four chapters. And again, we were getting to codifying the idea of a person with a disability not being the problem, if you like, but that the environment was being the problem. And it said that disability concentrates on the person and the person's impairment. And handicap concentrates on that interaction between the person 
and the environment. Again, we have that word handicap is still there, but the idea of separating the person and their interaction with their uh, environment was becoming more clear. Then the World Health Organization got in on the act <laughs> and, and bowed maybe to pressure from, from the likes of us who are complaining about them. And they, they launched the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health in 2001. This resulted from 10 years of pressure and 10 years of revision by who, the WHO itself. It speaks about functional limitation, but it also, again, for the first time from the WHO, talked about interaction with the environment. And we've, we're moving more and more into where we as people with disability want it to be. And if we jump forward to what Ganella originally wanted me to talk about, <laughs> was the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is probably the ultimate statement of where we were going with this. The, uh, the UN Convention was adopted on the December 13th, 2006, was adopted by the UN. It was open for signatures on March 30th, 2007. It, made a, it broke a number of records on its first day. There were 82 signatures, 42 signatures to the optional protocol, and even one ratification on its opening day. That had never happened before. That was more than any, uh, any other UN treaty ever. It was the first human rights convention of the 21st century. It was the first convention that was open to regional organizations like the uh, European Union. No other treaty, UN treaty were open to organizations like that in the past. And the convention came into force on May 3rd, 2008. So I'm just going to make a couple of final comments. I think everyone here knows about the importance of the UN Convention. And Derek is going to be talking later about many other international agreements. So I'm not going to steal his thunder and talk too much about that. But I will make one differential. And that's the difference between impairment and disability as described in the UN Convention. Impairment for my sake, I'm blind. And if you like, that's the medical side. And that's fine. There is medical issues there. But disability is, whether, is, is about how I interact with my environment. Ganella, have I time to tell a quick story? Jerry, if you could very quickly yes, tell please us go a ahead. story and wrap up. Okay, a very Thanks. quick story. I used to work in a place that was about uh, at the end of about of a five mile straight road and I used to get a bus to work every day. The bus, I'd ask the bus driver, will you give me a shout at the American Embassy? Sometimes you would, sometimes you wouldn't. It always was a he, by the way, so I'm not being sexist. So I'd say, will you give me a shout at the American Embassy? Sometimes he'd remember, sometimes he'd forget. And of course, then he'd be embarrassed, I'd be embarrassed, I'd be late for work. My, pe my uh, people I worked with had to um, cover for me because I was in late, right? I then got an accessible GPS device. I set the GPS device to give me an alarm at the stop before my stop, and I never missed my stop again. I was just as blind the day before I got the GPS as the day after. My impairment didn't change one jot, but in that situation and in that environment, I was less disabled. And that demonstrates the importance of the UN Convention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. And apologies, I got a little late coming here this morning. There were just in a huge number of complications. Everything went wrong, basically. But I'm very happy to, uh, that we are here for the first of the three sessions, I think, in the same room this morning, all of which look at accessibility and disability. The one that uh, you're in currently is called I Can't Use This App, and it looks at the gaps in accessibility. Uh, and we have five speakers. Jerry, thank you very much for starting off the panel. Our next speaker is also an in-person speaker who I will introduce, and then we have three remote speakers who are actually already on the um, remote participation system, and we'll bring them in. So our second speaker is Nidhi Goel, 
from point of view in India. And Nidhi, if you would like to introduce yourself a little more and then start. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vishaka. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here at 9 a.m. Uh, I just, you know, I'm also a disability rights activist. I live with a disability myself, um, and I also am a stand-up comedian back home in India. I wanted to actually go a little deeper and take off from where um, what Jerry was speaking. He was speaking about the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The three key, key pillars of the uh, convention are discrimination, non-discrimination, reasonable accommodation, and universal access. Um, and we think if we keep these in mind as the human rights for persons with disabilities and then connect them with what universal access would mean in an internet or an online space or a space of technology. Uh, we speak about sustainable development goals, which talks about leaving no one behind. And then uh, many of the countries, like India, many other countries in South Asia, have framed new disability laws based on the CRPD and the SDGs. What would this mean for someone like me, for someone who's a user of technology, who lives with a disability as well? If I just had to take you through a life cycle, you know, if I, if I brought this into a very human terrain and said, let's look at a life cycle approach, let's see how a person, what's the life of a person with a disability and how they would interact with the apps and what issues would come up if universal access principles were not kept in mind, which they're not in many cases. Um, so we, persons with disabilities make up 15% of the global population. Data is really missing. So here I cannot quote how many people in which country are living with a disability and are internet users or have smartphones um, because data in case of disability is really, really missing. But in general, in the global south, people with disabilities live um, not fully independent lives. They're still battling with a lot of stigma. They're battling with in, inaccessible infrastructure, um, navigating unhelpful education, education systems, inaccessible independent living modes, so access to hospitals, bankings, and other, other things that many, many non-disabled people take for granted. How has technology improved? In all of these inaccessibilities, something that created an enabling environment. Uh, when Jerry was talking about environment, it was enabling environment that moved the focus from just the person to how the environment interacts with the person with a disability. And technology really brought all of that. It, it leveled the playing field. Today, you can sit there and I can be here and I can work with you because I can access the email through my screen readers. I can uh, type out notes. I can, I can uh, browse the internet, um, read papers, do research. When this technology did not think of universal access, the, the divide between disabled and non-disabled persons, the leveling of the playing field, that level grew, the, the, the divide grew wider and the gap grew bigger. Let me give you some few examples here. Um, if someone with a disability who's using a voiceover, which is a screen reader on the phone, or a talkback feature on any other phone, um, they're not accessible with, let's say, a recreational app. So you cannot book your own tickets, you cannot make reservations in restaurants. If you're trying to order food, menus are not accessible, which means they're images, so none of the screen readers would read it. If we look at everyday functioning, banking and payment gateways are not accessible. And that not only leaves you behind in terms of um, not being able to have financial independence, but it also jeopardizes your security, which means that you're actually sharing your password or asking someone to help you navigate through a banking or financial system. And we've seen this in offline spaces as well, where all the advocacy has been happening for talking ATMs, for accessible banks, etc. But we are making these online facilities, which are for quicker solutions, more inaccessible for people with disabilities. Um, if we talk about office platforms, there are many office platforms in, the, in this global age of having sort of a global working staff, of a flexible working culture. There are many office platforms um, that, do not, uh, that do not cater to persons with across disabilities and have inaccessible features or not designed on the basis of the W3CAG. Um, those are the Web Accessibility Consortium guidelines, um, which means they don't function for someone with a screen reader. What would that mean 
if we look at employment of persons with disabilities, the employment opportunities are really skewed. We're talking about unequal pay and there is evidence around uh, labor and disability. When we create further virtual platforms, which are supposed to be bringing offices together, more fragmented for persons with disabilities and inaccessible, the employment opportunities can go further down. It can be very discouraging, isolating, et cetera. Um, again, something where we take um, in our daily lives some um, apps that we take really for granted, um, apps where not just you can um, function around banking or ordering something or um, um, booking for recreation purposes. If you're trying to connect with someone, if you're trying to find a partner for yourself, there are apps that do not allow you um, or are, on, are not exactly labeled in the way they should be, right? So you're ending up in a very confused scenario, particularly in dating apps where you're trying to click interest and you click non-interest and you're trying to not show interest and you're showing interest. Um, in this scenario, I would bring a little bit of the gender piece here uh, and the safety piece. Uh, when there's a woman with a disability trying to access apps, particularly in culturally conservative societies where women with disabilities have a lot of stigma on their own sexuality, where they're considered sexually undesirable. When they're trying to make matches in a very pressurizing situation, they may not want to tell another person that they are on this dating app because they would in general receive a lot of um, discontent from the family or a lot of mocking from friends uh, where they would hear saying, but who would, you know, anyway, you're not gonna find anyone. Why would you be on this app? So a place that you could, could be liberating for others um, becomes a further place of stigma, stigma and restriction for a woman with a disability. Um, I can go on and on with many examples here. I think what's important is to see that online is slowly, unfortunately, mirroring the evils in terms of barriers and inaccessibilities for persons with disabilities. Um, and that becomes an even bigger problem because this is supposed to be a site of empowerment. This is supposed to be a site of enablement and of solutions. If we look at other pieces of technology, and if I had to again give a, a gender disability example before I make my final couple of comments, um, is devices that use softwares in it, right? So if you're talking about, let's say, um, a reproductive health device, if you speak about a pregnancy kit, um, just adding a simple voice or a beep or some kind of audio feedback would enable women who are blind to use those pregnancy kits. Because in many countries, as we know, there are very restricted abortion laws. Um, and in that scenario, for a woman with uh, visual impairment to go up to someone and say, hey, can you see if I'm pregnant or not, may again cause many further social complications for her, um, besides the fact that it would jeopardize her privacy. Onus again here, uh, for many tech users with a disability, the onus, like in everything else, has gone on the person with a disability. Um, in many inaccessible educational spaces, the common phrase that we hear as disabled people is, you need it, you make it accessible. And even here, uh, we're experiencing in the online space that the idea is that if you want it, you make the advocacy and then it will become accessible. Or even further problematic, is the ghettoizing, saying, but these apps are specially made for you, so why don't you stick to these? Um, and this really resembles in, um, before accessible GPS came in, um, there were apps like uh, Foursquare, which were particularly for blind users. And then the idea was, uh, why don't you use that app for uh, navigation? Why would you need some other navigation app to be accessible? The idea is that you will have exclusive disabled, disabled dating platforms which are accessible. Why would you need a mainstream dating platform to be accessible? So ha putting the onus on the disabled person, ghettoizing them further, are really two very problematic approaches in this. Um, I think some of the issues are also um, you know, two, two, two quick um, ideas that I want to leave here with are that one, that if we started as individuals to think about accessibility in our own spaces, right? If we thought, okay, we are users of Twitter, we are users of Facebook, um, what if there's another disabled user? How do we sort of also imagine the world to be beyond what we know maybe? You know, maybe a, d a disabled person is not in our immediate surrounding, but maybe they're all 
over there, 15% is not a small number. Um, what if we start describing images? We use a lot of GIFs and memes on Twitter, and what if we just add, took those 10 seconds extra to say what that important information around safety for the woman, or what that important information breaking news was in the photograph that you've posted on Twitter, or even what the joke was, because it's really annoying to be on Twitter and everyone's saying, hey, this was amazing, laughing out loud, and ha ha ha, and you're like, but I wanna laugh too. Um, and I think these are very human things where we get left out of. Um, secondly, as organizations, as governments, as multiple stakeholders, if we strengthen our procurement policies, if we say, okay, we're now either procurement or usage user policies, mm -hmm. where we say, okay, now we are committed to accessibility and inclusion. We may not have anyone right now in our organization or within our governments um, who's disabled. Let's say we don't have anyone disabled. But what if our next person is disabled? What if tomorrow I turn disabled? What if we understand that we are all temporarily able bodies um, and say we are going to have strict procurement and user policies where we will only engage with platforms that think about accessibility, that are accessible. That as a larger movement will enable more and more engagement or push more and more developers to think about the web accessibility guidelines. It's easy to build keeping the accessibility guidelines in mind, which take, take universal, which are built on the uh, concept of universal access because every disability has a different specification and a different need. Um, and so having that in mind would really, really help. Uh, but also working backwards and making retrospective changes. Mm -hmm. Remembering that accessibility is not an accident because many apps achieve accessibility by accident and then the next version mm -hmm. or an upgrade, it's gone, right? The accessibility link is broken. Accessibility and inclusion has to be intentional because any of us could need this later in life. I'll leave with a small story of why technology, in particular, we're all focusing a lot on ICT inclusion and access, um, is that a friend of mine who's quadriplegic, which means that neck downwards, his body does not work, and he's in a wheelchair, and he said, when I was a kid, my, I read a lot, but I read what my mother wanted me to read. Today, because there's technology and I can access it, I can build my own knowledge the way I want to. And that's the power of technology, and that is why we want it to be inclusive and accessible for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nidhi, and thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, we now move to our three remote participants, and we would like to start with Shadi Abu Zara. Uh, who works with the World Wide Web Consortium on the Web Accessibility Initiative as the Accessibility Strategy and Technology Specialist. Shadi, are you able to connect with us? Okay, let's give it a moment in case uh, Shadi is online, but in case we're not able to connect with Shadi in a... Hello, I, oh, fab. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I'm just reading in the captions. We are able to hear you, me, Shadi. But somebody has actually muted the room so we cannot hear you any longer on the remote. Okay. Oh. oh, there you are, back again. Okay, thanks. Are you able to hear us now, Shadi? Now, now I hear you, yes. And we so can hear you turn, clearly. So is my I guess? Yes. I've already introduced <laughs> you, so please go ahead. Thank you. Th thanks to the captions, uh, we we are able to communicate even though we did not hear each other. My name is Shadi Abuzara. I work for the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. And um, I must say it was impressive introductions by Jerry and Nidhi, um, who presented really important aspects from the policy making 
and Nidhi in particular provided here some concrete examples of how accessibility affects people's lives. Now, um, I'm more the tech person, um, here to talk to you more about the standards that we developed that Nidhi had also mentioned. And I think there's a strong relationship between standards and policies. Um, the policies describe the intention, what needs to happen, um, and, and the standards set the criteria of how to actually achieve that or, or uh, what it actually means to be accessible. Um, and there are multiple things. The web, as, as we all know, um, is becoming part of our everyday life. And by web here, we have a very broad definition. Web was initially just what works in your browser. It was initially just a specification called HTML and HTTP. Uh, one is a protocol to transfer the information from the server to your web browser. And HTML is really the format uh, that encodes what the web content is. Today we have hundreds of such standards and protocols in the background to provide the rich experience that you have on the web, um, to provide the mobile apps, to provide all these functions on payments and um, uh, banking, leisure, um, civic participation, all these aspects that have been mentioned before. Uh, there are standards to help achieve this. And on the one hand, this is really great because this is, um, as was mentioned before, provides a level playing field uh, in, um, in participation and equal participation for everyone. Um, on the other hand, it is also something that requires continual guidance. And I think this is one of the big issues is that we continue having year for year, thousands and thousands, if not more, of um, people who complete their education in IT uh, or related um, studies and courses in programming, in web development, in web design, in all these aspects, but never actually hear of accessibility. And <clears throat> imagine having thousands of architects, all these architects completing their studies and never thinking about accessibility. It's the same online. When all these people who are creating the apps creating the technologies, creating the products and the services, have never actually encountered accessibility. Um, also, maybe due to the segregation in our societies, never actually really encountered people with disabilities themselves and never thought about the importance of accessibility. And I want to make one thing clear. Accessibility is not only for people with disabilities. Just the example of captions just now, I think was uh, a very good example of how accessibility does not only benefit the 15 or 20% of the population, but the majority, depending on the situation. We now all benefited from having captions because the audio was broken. And there are many such situations. When you want to expand the font size, it might not be necessarily because you have reduced visual acuity, but maybe just because you're more comfortable with having an enlarged text size. Or having the content being read out loud to you. This is something that for many years, text-to-speech was only used by small numbers of people, by people with disabilities. Now uh, that it has become more mainstream, people are recognizing the benefits of being able to talk to your computer and your computer talk to you. And we're seeing all sorts of applications being deployed, ironically, very often then forgetting about accessibility. So you have a talking computer that forgets to consider accessibility, um, which is specifically, um, you know, the, in, the initial reason um, or the initial background of how it actually became to have this functionality. At W3C, we develop the core standards for the web, things like HTML and XML and all these core standards that are used to create websites and mobile apps and, and, and technologies, um, web-based technologies. But on top of that, 
We also have the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is part of W3C that focuses on how to make the web accessible. And we have accessibility guidelines that have been mentioned before. Uh, most well known is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, which explains to content authors what requirements they need to uh, ensure in the content that they're authoring to make it accessible. And by content, we really mean anything that is published on the web. This is images, audio, forms, interactions, um, all these things uh, we generally call content. And these are requirements in the web content accessibility guidelines, such as captioning, such as ensuring sufficient color contrast, um, such as ensuring that text size can be changed, providing headings so that people can understand the content um, and how it's structured. Many such requirements are put in these guidelines that web content authors should follow. We also have other guidelines for the producers of web browsers and media players. So for example, if I provide captions, but they are not displayed in my media player or in my browser, then that also breaks the accessibility. So we look at accessibility from end to end, from the production all the way to the consumption uh, and to the interaction by the end user, who in most cases is a person with disability. But again, um, we want to emphasize the increased value of accessibility to people, um, to anyone really, depending on the situation. We've just released an updated version of this web content accessibility guidelines. Um, we have been operating on version 2.0 since December 2008, um, so maybe 10 years ago. And um, these are internationally recognized in many policies around the world uh, by many governments and businesses um, who rely on the web content accessibility guidelines as a measure for accessibility. This includes Europe and the US, Australia and Canada, uh, Brazil, and um, even in China right now, there are activities towards a national standard on web accessibility, um, and they are, uh, there are discussions on the uptake of WCAG in that context, um, the WCAG. Um, we have just released version 2.1 of these guidelines with several improvements for people with low vision, people with cognitive and learning disabilities, and people using mobile devices. Uh, particularly, the additions of requirements for mobile uh, has been really important because the uptake of mobile devices, and here by mobile, we mean a really broad definition from smartphones to PDAs, personal digital assistants, uh, tablet computers, even home appliances now are increasingly web-based and web-driven um, and using apps. Um, so to address these, uh, we have improved the guidelines to address these situations and these contexts as well. So to maybe close, I want to say that we have the standards, we have the means, we have the technology and the capability of being able to make these web services and apps accessible, including the examples that Nidhi had presented. The question is really, why is that not happening? Um, it's a matter of will, it's a matter of enforcing the policies, and it's a matter of ensuring that there's awareness and education and skills to be able to actually apply these standards in practice. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Shadi. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. And you check if could I, hear us clapping. Did, were you able to hear us clapping? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, thank you very thank much. Thank you, yes. <laughs> 
many people in the room are actually taking copious notes as all the speakers are presenting because we are getting so many sort of ideas, guidelines, principles, etc., that we really hope some of us will put into action after this session. So thank you very much again to our first three speakers. We still have two speakers, both of whom are remote participants. So I would now like to introduce Vashkar Bhattacharji, who is from Bangladesh, our next speaker, and is the program manager at Young Power in Social Action, where he's responsible for the overall strategic direction and management of disability and ICT-related activities. Like everybody else on this panel, Vashkar has many accomplishments in this area, but I want to actually just introduce him with, with one more sentence, which is on his bio, which says he is visually impaired, but refuses to let this be a restriction in his life and to his achievements. Vashkar, over to you. Um, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I feel honored to be part of this panel. Thank you very much. My mentor, Gunela, she have, um, and uh, um, Bishaka, who have included me in this panel to speak on behalf of um, Bangladeshi citizens with disabilities. Friends, uh, as you know, I am a person with visual disability and has been working in Bangladesh to promote accessible information and technology. Especially web accessibility is one of my primary agenda to, um, in Bangladesh. 10 years ago, Bangladesh government have launched a digital Bangladesh campaign. That means all the service becoming e-service. They have developed 25,000 of websites which are connected with each other. 200 plus e-service are available for the citizen. Now we need to ensure accessibility for citizens with disabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, our government have four commitments for people with disabilities. One, we have a constitution that is ensure equal access for all. And also, Bangladesh government have adopt a law that's called Persons with Disability Rights and Protection Act 2013. This law have a separate section to ensure information accessibility, accessible technology, web accessibility, and <clears throat> accessible reading materials, etc. Other hand, as like other country, our government have ratified the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disability. As you all know, we just crossed the 10 years of UN CRPD and CRPD give us the freedom to speak, freedom to access. This CRPD have Article 9, Article 21, which equally ensure um, information accessibility for all. And other international commitment our government had, that is SDG. As you know, at least five to seven goals clearly mention about the disabilities. So when you develop all the service into e-service, then you, and then government need a clear strategy to ensure equal service for all. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in our study we found in Bangladesh, 25,000 e-service and so 25,000 website and e-service, we face lots of difficulties for accessing because we don't have high quality text to speech. That was the biggest challenge for us. Then we are not able to access Bengali text in, um, in proper manner. Same time, Bangladesh government don't have any web accessibility guideline or standard, even though we have drafted one, which are not adapted yet. Um, we expect like international organization like ITU or web, um, W3C would collaborate with our government. That is our expectation from this workshop. Friends, so um, citizens with disabilities facing problem to accessing all the e-service and apps. I can give you some example. When I want to buy a train ticket, I cannot as the train ticket 
um, uh, the sites are not accessible for vision visibility. But nevertheless, government has taken the initiative to conduct a access audit to identify the gaps and challenges where um, and decided to develop a toolkit that can help the, both the um, stakeholders, such as the web designer and content provider to the end user. So by this web accessibility toolkit, we believe um, the problem to access web and information will be removed. Secondly, our government, uh, I think three years ago also, there was no accessible reading materials are available for citizens with visual disability. Our students never ever got a accessible books in the starting of their curriculum. But with the support of Service Innovation Fund, we have innovated full text, full audio multimedia talking book. By this multimedia talking book, visual impaired student can read and get the accessible books. And also we can easily print the braille books. Last three years, our Honorable Prime Minister are handovering accessible books to the persons with vision disability along with other students. Friends, I would like to share another success story. As a visual impaired person, I never ever get a single study materials from government side during my study. I just depend on my mothers and friends who have read the books and record it and I listen it. As there was no technology available for making braille's, we are highly dependent on the um, manual typing of the braille's. But now, and we never even dream that we could get some accessible dictionary or reading materials in higher education. Our government and my organization, Young Power in Social Action, Ipsha, has developed a dictionary that is called Accessible Dictionary. You can download from this accessible dictionary from Google Play Store by clicking Accessible Dictionary. Or you can visit www.accessibledictionary.gov.bd. You will find four dictionary which is accessible for all, including visual disability, print disability, learning disability, and also other students. This is the example of inclusive design. Anybody can access this dictionary from their devices. And this dictionary is highly compatible with the technology such as skin reading software and it is easily convertible into braille and last brain ladies and gentlemen still uh, we believe we need to go far and i we understand um, we need to work with the global community such as internet governance forum through internet governance forum my opinion we are not seeing much participation in the um, IGF types activities. ICT for development and other international agencies sometimes are reluctant to think about the accessibility of persons with disabilities. Even though in recent days, we are seeing some sessions and discussion, but how persons with disabilities like me, who are living in a developing world, will able to join in this forum? Who will support us to come here? But thanks God that we have the technology like remote a participation opportunity. That's why I'm here. I'm speaking on behalf uh, uh, of my community. Friends, we are also working with the community radio and we are making um, accessible books and information for the higher education. And our government have taken in initiative to develop a Bangladeshi first inclusive university in Chittagong, which is, uh, I think 100 plus students are studying there. They are making online platform and e-learning um, accessible e-learning systems for students with disabilities. Um, through this, I would like to end my speech and, and by giving remarks that without us, you cannot, without ensuring accessible information and technology, you cannot achieve SDG. Without ignoring people with disabilities, you will not able to achieve SDG. Without us, nothing about us. Please include us, give us the opportunity We'll return you and we'll serve for a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vashkar, and I hope you two were able to hear all of us clapping for you. Yeah, I am I'm hearing now. Great. <laughs> okay. 
Vashkar Bhattacharji. I'll, after this session, I can give you the spelling, uh, Leila. And our final panelist, ah, oh, are you seeing it there? Yes, yes, yeah, I can't see it from here. Our final panelist is actually my co-conspirator and co-organizer behind this panel, Gunella Astring from Australia. And before I introduce her, I want to say that we are, of course, very sad that three of our panelists are remote and not here in person. At the same time, we are happy that remote has worked and we could actually bring them in. But Gunella and I met at the IGF, I think about three IGFs back, just standing in a line. And we both discovered that we worked on disability. We just started talking to each other in some long queue. And since then, we've always been saying that we really want to push this issue and give it higher visibility at IGF. We tried to do something at the Asia Pacific region IGF this year, but that was in Vanuatu, which made it very hard for some of us to attend. And so I'm very pleased to say that finally Gunella and I were able to work on this panel and you know, submit it as a proposal as hopefully one of our first efforts to continue working together on this area. So now I would like to formally in, uh, introduce Gunella Astbrink, who's an Australian IGF ambassador and a director of ISOC Australia and the principal of GSA Infocom. Gunella is also a member of ICANN's APRALO and is currently a co-pen holder for the Rules of Procedures Review Working Group and is a member of the APR IGF multi-stakeholder group. So Gunella, welcome and I hope we are able to get you in too. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear, hear you. Yes. Sorry, I was Hello, looking ladies. at the caption. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, while you were introducing me, Bishaka, um, uh, I got disconnected and I was hoping you would give me a long introduction so the connection came back and it did. So thank you very much. I don't know what you said, but it was a good time frame. Thank you. Um, so I'm delighted to be speaking with you uh, today. I wish I could be there, but um, hopefully the um, network connection will continue operating uh, for the next um, uh, eight, eight or nine minutes. So uh, we've heard a range of, of different speakers talking about uh, policy, talking about their personal experiences. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about people with disability and their use and non-use um, based on surveys um, of the internet and phones. And this in, in particular with uh, countries in Pacific Island countries. This is the Global South developing countries. And uh, the, the status of ICT in the Pacific is that um, while we have relatively small populations from some countries being 10,000 in population up to about 8 million in Papua New Guinea, they are mostly very isolated, spread out over wide expanses of ocean. So there are considerable affordability and infrastructure problems uh, to, go, to do with um, how do you get uh, connectivity. Satellite services and submarine cables, which are very expensive, are finally bringing faster and more reliable services. However, there are uh, incredible costs uh, when it comes to computers and actually connecting to the internet. Um, most people would use smartphones to connect to the internet. Um, and I'm going to use the example of Vanuatu, where probably over 75% of the population use mobile phones. Mobile phones. However, however, however disability, disability um, have um, very limited very educational limited and employment opportunities uh, in a country like Vanuatu. And there's uh, a lot of socio-cultural barriers, which I think Nidhi 
uh, talked about from the point of view of India, they are certainly there in uh, a number of Pacific Island countries. Um, however, there was a pilot project in Vanuatu um, uh, led by ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and this was done uh, in conjunction with the Pacific Disability Forum, which is the Pacific-wide advocacy body in the Pacific, and the government of Vanuatu. And for the first time in the Pacific, uh, we were able to collect baseline data uh, on how um, people with disability use um, uh, ICT. There were interviews with over 200 people with disability. Most of those interviews, were they were all face to face. Most of them were done by people with disability themselves. So it was a community connecting with their community. And this was done in towns and villages in a number of different islands across the nation. And uh, we collected data about um, their, their background, uh, their education level, how did they use a the phone, did they um, uh, use particular features of the phone, what were their barriers, did they know about the internet. So from that um, we had a number of findings and many people had not heard of the internet, which is quite astounding. Many do not have a mobile phone, if they do it's not a smartphone. One of the things is that a mobile phone needs to have a long battery life because there's limited access to electricity in many, many uh, villages um, across the nation. So we found that they are just a few small examples and I know I have very limited time left. So I'm going to very quickly state that there, we also did a web accessibility audit of 28 government websites. We found, um, based on WCAG 2.0, that really no uh, websites were accessible. Uh, accessible. And, but however, some outcomes uh, from that were that the government um, has a freedom of information or what they call right to information unit and uh, it developed web accessibility guidelines. These are totally based on WCAG 2.0 but they explain particular aspects in a way that's relevant for that particular country and come with examples of how to plan for web accessibility that's relevant for um, people in Vanuatu. And this was all done with consultation with the disability community. Um, another outcome was that the Pacific Disability Forum extended the project uh, with um, other funding to survey more countries. So four more countries were surveyed, Papua New Guinea, Cook Islands, Fiji and the Marshall Islands. And and there are a number of similar results to what we discovered in Vanuatu. So I'll just finish off by saying that we can recommend an, a number of ways forward to hopefully improve accessibility. First of all, having a multifaceted approach. So we have disability and ICT accessibility awareness raising for government officials and for, for NGOs as well. We need to implement the policies. We've heard that already in this session. It's not enough just to have a policy. We need to find ways to implement it. We need to have the legislation and the regulatory mechanisms there in place. Other ways forward are practical measures. We obviously need accessible websites, facilities, products and services. We need subsidised costs. We absolutely have to have training in ICT usage for people with disability. There's a huge digital divide there. And finally, in planning all of this, there needs to be people with disability 
included as part of that training mechanism. I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gunella. And we are at 10 a.m., which essentially is the time at which we are supposed to finish. Uh, I was hoping we would have time for a few questions, but when we applied for the workshop proposal and had five speakers, our assumption was that we would get a 90-minute slot, which used to be the sort of uh, standard slot at earlier IGFs. Since we have a 60-minute slot and we really didn't want to reduce or cut down any of our speakers or the time available to them, uh, I don't think we're going to have any time for questions un without we affecting give, we the We can give you five session. minutes from our workshop, so two Sorry? questions. We can give you five minutes from our workshop, so please do. That's I couldn't hear. I think he's giving five minutes from the next workshop. Oh, he is? Yeah, yeah Jerry just gave us from their workshop. Okay, well, in that case, we have five minutes till 10.05 for a couple of questions. And then we move, the next workshop starts at 10.10, so we definitely want to clear the space. I see a hand up, yeah. Hi, uh, so uh, my name is Belen, I'm from Paraguay. And uh, basically, I'm Paraguay is in South America, and uh, uh, I have a friend who, I, I work at an NGO that uh, works with themes related to digital rights, and I have a friend who is part of an association that works with uh, kids with visual impairment. So my NGO uh, gives workshops, like digital security workshops, and she wanted, uh, she wanted us to go there and, and, and teach that, but I would really like to get more tools and to do more research in order to give a proper workshop. Do you have any tools or any advice for that? Nidhi, Jerry, Vashkar, Gudela, Shadi, any, uh, if you all could hear the question remotely as well and can comment on this. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another question. Yeah. Hi. Um, good morning. I'm Lily from Ghana and an Internet Society Youth Fellow. Um, I want to know quickly the divide, the divide you're talking about, uh, is it in devices or in ac internet accessibility? Um, if it's an, I, I've I heard more about accessibility here, so it doesn't mean that we have um, people, we have devices that actually suit people with disability, like those who can see, do we have braille devices, do we have, um, for those who can hear, and um, exactly where is the divide? Okay, so would any of the speakers like to come in on these uh, questions? Um, okay, uh, my name is Hashkur. Um, I think for um, visual impairment um, technology, you could communicate with me. I think you can collect the uh, email address from uh, Boisheki and I could send you some resources. Thank you. This is Shadi Abuzara. If I may add, um, we, we provide. Um, re educational resources and training materials at w3.org slash WAI. These materials are freely available. We also have translations um, for many of these resources and we welcome more translations if you want to use them locally. Regarding the second question on where are the, wh where is, so to say, the divide uh, between accessible and non-accessible, it's really in the design. In my view, I think any ICT product can be made accessible. Um, nowadays, it's the question of whether it's designed to be accessible or not. So it really comes from the content. So think of a mobile phone. A mobile phone, um, meanwhile, has text-to-speech um, and has voice input and has all these things. But if the app designer does not build on these functions that the phone has, then um, the phone does not become accessible. And also from ITU has and a document on recommendations around accessible meetings, which is freely available. So if you want to talk to me about that, I can tell you where to find that. Yes, I just want to quickly respond. Um, for and I'd just like to add. Yes. Go ahead, Gunella. Go ahead, Gunella. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the Internet Society um, on its website uh, has a couple of resources that um, I was involved in writing. One is an issues paper on accessibility that has a lot of um, useful background and also there is an accessibility toolkit which uh, summarizes some of those uh, particular um, issues and as it so happens Vashgar is featured in that as well as a case study so there are other particular resources you might want to use. Thanks. Okay. So just two very um, short and quick responses in addition to what people have said there are a lot of resources also freely available online to train uh, young students with visual impairment you may want to do a combination of technology and tactile um, and that might really help young kids with uh, visual disabilities. So when we work with adolescents and youth with visual disabilities around sexual and reproductive health and rights, we use technology, so audio described films, short clips, uh, audio stories, all of that, but also a lot of tactile models and materials. Um, the second thing around digital divide, um, in addition again to the divide in the design, I think Gunella mentioned when she was talking about the research findings, is that there is a digital divide when it comes to actual access, connectivity, and affordability of devices as well for persons with disabilities, because in many global south countries, again, there is um, lack of social security or any support from the government. So procuring accessible devices or softwares that assist you, etc., the entire cost is on the family or the person with a disability themselves. So affordability and access to um, and devices that, that are accessible are also an issue. Okay, thank you very much for those questions. Thank you for giving us that extra time, Jerry and Derek. And thank you very much to all our speakers as well as to my co-organizer, Gunella. Can we just give the panel a loud round of applause? Can I just say, don't go too far, go grab a coffee, be back, we'll start at 10.15 for the next panel. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. give me one second. I just stashed everything quickly. It, it worked with captions, yeah. etc. I was so happy. Oh my God, it's I was come together so, so well. scared <laughs> about the results. <laughs> I know, I know. Cam wouldn't turn up. Oh my God. I, if we well, wouldn't we three cancel, oh it was no. just a nightmare this then morning. We bought another cab which took us to a different. I mean, <laughs> well, it was great. Gunella gave me nice, you know, she laid the foundation I'm well so happy before you Because we just broke the queue and ran. Oh, good. We good. were good. like, good. we're running. That Sorry, guys. Sorry for being. Not mannered. Ah, nice.